And good evening, and uh, thank you, the Reed Library, for inviting me tonight uh, to talk about um, some of the early days of TV and some of the stories that uh, I've been told over the years. My name is Evan Weiner, and um, I am uh, an old-time uh, radio guy. I started out uh, at WGRC Radio. Well, actually, I didn't start out at WGRC Radio. I started out in 11th grade at uh, Spring Valley High School. I had a teacher by the name of Joe Dionisio. And uh, Joe uh, was uh, the uh, liaison between the school and a radio station, WRKL 910 on the dial. And uh, the school had a 15 minute weekly show called Tiger Talk on WRKL. And uh, Joe comes up to me and he says, student, student, you have a good voice. How would you like to be on radio? And I said, find the worst way in the worst way. And I was, uh, I was on the show called Tiger Talk. Uh, Joe never called anybody by their names. It was always student. And I still keep in touch with Joe nearly 50 years later, and he still calls me student. And uh, he opened the door for me, not only in radio, but at the Nyack Journal News and the Bergen Record, where I had three stints. Uh, I'm going to skip over six and a half years. I'm working at WGRC Radio in Nanuet, New York, 500 watt radio station. It's um, Actually, we're coming up to the 43rd anniversary of this, or just had it. Uh, my uh, news director, Steve North, said uh, Saturday uh, afternoon, the Democrats are holding this big fundraiser over in Nyack. Uh, would you like to go? Well, I want you to go over there and cover it. And I said, sure, no problem. And um, all the big shots from those days, Mario Cuomo and you, Carey, and uh, this obscure assemblyman by the name of Jerome Nadler, who you might have heard of, uh, were all there. And then there was this tall, good looking guy who comes in and he looks at me and says, I like you. And I knew who he was. He was John Lindsay. Uh, not hearing audio. Hang on. Um, my mic is on. Every, everybody else, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I guess um, try again, Brian. Um, yeah. Try again. Come back in. Uh, anyway, so it's uh, John Lindsay is there. And uh, he comes up to me and he says, uh, hey, I like you. I want to tell you something. I said, well, tell me what you want. He says, uh, I'm running for Senate for New York in 1980. And uh, I said, can, uh, um, can, he, can I use this? He said, sure. And I send it to UPI. I send it to AP. And um, uh, I get a call from WNEW Radio. Uh, in New York. It was Henry Marcotte. And Henry says to me, uh, hey, we'd like to buy that uh, piece of audio from you and have you do a, a report. I said, sure. How much are you going to pay me? He said, 10 bucks. I said, sold. And uh, yeah, I was uh, uh, on WNEW radio, William B. Williams and all that doing news uh, part-time there as a stringer for three and a half years. So, um, and then I got into uh, other forms of the media, including TV. Anyway, when I was a kid, that was my favorite TV show, The Indian Head Test Pattern. Hey, if you go out to Scandinavia, you would have seen a Viking, or if you went up to uh, uh, Canada, you would have seen a beaver there. And uh, it was cool for me, because uh, if that was on uh, at night, and I'm the last one watching it, that means I went to sleep later than my parents. Uh, you know, we used to have a we used to have a lot of trouble watching TV. You, you must remember this because, uh, you know, you'd, you'd get up and you'd have to walk over to the TV and you'd have to turn it on and then you'd sit down because it took, you know, half minute to a minute for the tube to warm up and then it would roll all over the place and there was snow and you fixed the rolling and then you had the snow and then you had to hold the antenna a certain way and then you looked and said I don't like this show so you had to move over and turn the dial again and if somebody else came into the room and there was still snow on the TV you would hold the antenna and go into a weird position and the other person hey don't move don't move don't move we got the picture perfect. I can't stay this way. I'm not a contortionist. Don't worry about it. It's only four more minutes. That's what you have to ha hang out for. Today, it's so easy because you got a remote and you just point and that's that. Boy, we had to work to watch TV. Uh, but TV has been around for a long, long time. And uh, maybe the impetus for this talk uh, came from uh, Howard Cosell. Um, TV has been around for a long time. Started out in Schenectady, New York. Uh, in the General Electric Laboratories uh, in 1928. 
WRGB was known as W2XB, then WRGB. Today it's known as WGY Television. But I said that uh, this talk, this talk may have had its infancy in the lobby of Gallagher's at 8th Avenue and 52nd Street uh, back in the 1980s. Now, I knew Howard Cosell and I was friendly with him. And to this day, I'm still friendly with his grandsons, uh, Justin, who's a uh, charter school principal, Colin, who is the New York Mets PA announcer, and uh, Jared, uh, Jared Kahana, who's uh, a uh, lawyer with ESPN. In fact, I heard from Jared a couple of weeks ago on something. And uh, Howard is, uh, we're waiting to get into this place. We're going to a boxing, uh, private boxing function upstairs at Gallagher's, and, uh, but we couldn't get into the place. We got there 5 to 12, 10 to 12. They opened the place at 12 o'clock. And so they put us in a little meeting room. And Howard and, well, Howard was talking down at me. Let's, let's, let's be honest here. And he's waffling away about the history of TV. And he says, you know, when they write the history of TV, they're going to write about the three Cs. Cronkite, Coso, Kassim. Not necessarily in that order. Well, here's what Howard's getting to. Cronkite started in TV in the 1950s. Cosell started on Channel 7 in New York around 1954. And Carson was bouncing around TV in the uh, 1950s. Uh, but by the 1960s, uh, old iron pants, as you see here, uh, talking about John Kennedy was just killed takes the glasses off, sheds a tear, uh, regains his composure. The glasses are back on and old iron pants is back in the saddle doing his job. And with that, he becomes the most trusted man in TV. And you can make an argument that um, nobody's replaced Walter Cronkite as the most trusted man on TV delivering the news. Uh, and then there's Howard, Howard goes. So Howard once told me, he says, you do this. Uh, be the most popular man on TV in 1974 and the most hated man on TV in 1974. And I said, Howard, Howard, I cannot top you. I, I have a lot of stories about Howard, but I'm talking about television here. But Howard was the reason that most people watched Monday Night Football on ABC. Rune Arledge hired him, and he was the first hire because Rune wanted to get away as football as a, or get away from the concept of football as a game and he wanted to make football a game and entertainment, or entertainment that featured the game, and he certainly did with Howard and Dandy Don Meredith. Uh, and there is, uh, here's Johnny. Uh, Johnny had about 19 different lives on The Tonight Show. Starts out 1962, it's a five day a week show, 90 minutes a night. Uh, by the time he's done in 1982, he's barely there. He's there, what, three times a week? The last guest would have been, uh, was Bette Midler. And uh, if you look at Carson, and if you look at what uh, Howard said, Cronkite probably hasn't been replaced. Howard certainly hasn't been replaced. Um, there's nobody who comes near Howard's stature. And, uh, and Johnny, um, I don't care what you say about Jay Leno. I don't care what you say about uh, Colbert or Kimmel or David Letterman. They don't touch Johnny. Johnny had 30 million viewers a night. There were 30 million people who went to bed with Johnny Carson every night. There was this woman who said, I didn't go to bed. I ironed clothes while I watched Johnny. He made me relax as I ironed clothes. This was at a talk that I gave about two years ago. The early beginnings or the beginnings of television in a Pittsburgh laboratory, the Westinghouse Laboratory in Pittsburgh with Vladimir Cosmer's walk-in. Uh, he invents the iconoscope, which is kind of a tube, uh, and hopefully he's going to get television transmission through that tube. Uh, and then comes Philo Farnsworth, and uh, he's working for GE. Know this, Westinghouse, GE, or trying to put together TV. And by 1927, you want to blame when you were a kid who you couldn't watch a show because it rolled and rolled and rolled? Well, blame Farnsworth, because he comes up with a transmission a television image composed of 60 horizontal lines. And if you were around in the 50s and 60s, you could count every one of those horizontal lines as they flew by. Uh, the first regular electric television service was in Germany. Starts in Berlin, March 22nd, 1935. 
And it wasn't for entertainment purposes. It was for sinister purposes by the Nazi regime. Uh, it did use a 180 line system. It was on the air about 90 minutes uh, a week, um, three times a week. Uh, but it wasn't there for entertainment. It was there to convince Germans that they were the superior people and they were going to see it during the 1936 Olympics, except that guy came along, Jesse Owens, and wins a whole bunch of gold medals and Hitler gets so disgusted he turns his back on Jesse Owens. And um, television really wasn't a hit in Germany. Uh, yeah, it was on up to eight hours a day in Berlin and Hamburg, uh, showing the Summer Olympics, where Germany, of course, winning all the gold medals. But uh, it didn't catch on. The TV was too expensive. Uh, people weren't buying it. So the Nazis said, OK, this propaganda machine's not working. Let's turn somewhere else. And they did. And they gave up television. Um, I was on Long Island a couple of years ago. I was, uh, it was November 2019, one of the last times I suppose I was out, late 2019. And um, there was, uh, I showed this picture at this place and there was a guy who was about 93 years old. And uh, when I'm live, it's back and forth. I'm not scripted. You could say anything you want and I may or may not answer it. Anyway, the guy said, uh, I want to say something. And he said, and I said, what's that? He said, I was there. I said, you were there. I said, what was it like? He said, I was on TV. I said, you were. And he said, uh, yeah, we walked into the pavilion, the pavilion of the future. And they had what we looked at as a one-eyed monster there because it's what the TV looked like. And so we're walking around that circle. And um, one of the people who was working there comes up to my parents. He said, can we borrow your boy for a minute? We want to put him on TV. And the parents said, of course. Yeah, yeah. And they saw him on TV. He didn't see himself on TV. But he said that it was so exciting knowing that he was on TV and that his parents were watching him on TV. Now, television in the United States is introduced at the World's Fair in Flushing Meadow in, uh, on April 30th, 1939. And uh, if you were there uh, at the uh, pavilion, you might have gotten this flyer from uh, RCA, TV, uh, RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, what television will mean to you. Now, up in the Carmel, I doubt that you got the signal because the signal which came off the Empire State Building went 50 miles north, 50 miles east, 50 miles west, 50 miles south, and Carmel probably is just outside of the uh, of what would have been the viewing area. And there probably weren't any TVs in Carmel anyway. There were just 400 in the New York City area uh, when Franklin Roosevelt went on on April. 30th, 1939. But uh, this flyer would tell you, hey, buy a TV. You can watch uh, the Metropolitan Opera or some opera. You can watch boxing. Uh, you can watch an award show. Uh, you can watch a baseball game. You can watch a political campaign uh, and other things. And you'll never have to leave your living room anymore. It's right there. All the entertainment you're going to get. You don't have to leave your living room. It's all there. And um, I don't know how many people bought the televisions because they were in Flushing Meadow, uh, but some did, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, he could afford it, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went up to Hyde Park, and I do a whole bunch of speeches. I do a talk on the 1936 Berlin Olympics. I worked with Marty Glickman. Uh, Marty used to curse out Avery Brundage. I just all you had to do is mention Avery to Marty. I worked with Marty in the late 1980s on his NBC uh, broadcast school, um, and he still owes me a hundred bucks. So maybe next lifetime I'll get it. But anyway, uh, so I go up to Hyde Park with my wife, and uh, Franklin's there. And oh, they're really nice guests. Great, great hosts. Really great hosts. And the books there a little stiff, but they're okay. And I went up there basically to find out three things. One was uh, why did you allow the Olympic team to go to Berlin in 1936? Got my answer. Uh, you're the first one on TV. Yeah, got my answer. And why did you allow baseball to be played following Pearl Harbor Day? Um, FDR was on radio. He was a natural with the media. He had the fireside chats uh, unfiltered, was able to talk to people directly. And why not have the president of the United States who is an experienced speaker before crowds and on radio, and you're introducing a new medium, why not have FDR uh, be the first person on TV in the United States? Uh, and he was. 
Uh, that was April 30th, 1939, at the New York World's Fair, the first presidential speech ever on television in the United States. You want to buy a TV? Well, hey, prices started back in 1939 at uh, $200 for something uh, this screen size uh, to about $1,000, which means about uh, 1800 to about $9,000 today. Uh, the TV manufacturers were RCA, General Electric, Dumont, uh, five to 12 inch screens, the Dumonts, remember the Dumonts? They were furniture pieces, 14 inch screen, 19 inch screen. Uh, 1939, uh, WNBC's predecessor, WNBT uh, Channel One, did the first baseball game from Columbia University, Baker Field between Princeton and Columbia. That was May 17th, 1939. Disney is in on the ground floor of TV. He's on the BBC, and he's working with David Sarnoff here in the United States. And if you were a kid, and you had one of the 400 TVs in the New York area, you too might have been able to see a cartoon. And it's a Disney cartoon, because Disney's working on the ground floor. And Disney, you know, oh, right, you know, it might be a, a Mickey Mouse cartoon. And that might be Donald, might be, uh, oh, well, it might be, Pluto, you know, it might be Pluto or Goofy or some something you want to watch. Oh, I can't wait. This afternoon, I got a TV. I don't have to go to the movies anymore. I can watch it right here on TV. But that's who you got, Gus Goose. Gus Goose, who was a slob. Gus Goose never really caught on, although I think he was on who or was in the uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit uh, cartoon many, many years later. But uh, he just didn't work out, Gus. But Gus was Donald Duck's cousin. So you got to tell me how a goose and a duck could be cousins. But he was Donald's cousin. Uh, the first cartoon was May 19th. Uh, Donald's co uh, cousin Gus on the NBC experimental station W2XBS, later WNBC in New York, first time a movie cartoon shown in the United States. The first baseball game was at Ebbets Field. Actually, it was a doubleheader between the Cincinnati Reds and the Brooklyn Dodgers. Maybe Red Barber was the announcer. He was with Brooklyn at that time. Uh, and um, so you got uh, two Two games for the price of the TV. Doubleheader between the Dodgers and the Reds, August 26th. Uh, that's a copy of my ebook, uh, America's Passion, How a Coal Miner's Game Became the NFL in the 20th Century. And the reason I have that picture up is that that guy, Beanie Feathers, was with the Brooklyn Dodgers National Football League team, a uh, game against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Look at that referee. It looks like he's ready to go out golfing. And uh, if you take a look at uh, how uh, Feathers, the running back, is brought down, there might be some, uh, could have been a, a, a unsportsmanlike penalty called on that play where that fist is. But anyway, I talk about the Brooklyn Dodgers here because the first National Football League game was also on Channel One. And it was a game between the Brooklyn Dodgers and the Philadelphia Eagles, if you were in Philadelphia, uh, from Ebbets Field. And by that point in the fall of 1939, there were a thousand TVs in the New York area. Uh, NBC and CBS both begin before World War II. Uh, slowly they begin. The war would delay television's progress. It was a temporary delay when the GIs did come home in 1945, 1946. They wanted a couple things. They wanted the GI Bill. They wanted a house in suburbia, Levittown, Long Island. There's a Levittown in New Jersey as well. Uh, and they wanted TV. And uh, that's what they got eventually. Uh, but in 1940, before the United States enters World War II, the Metrop Metropolitan Opera uh, is broadcast for the first time, NBC Studios at 30 Rock. Uh, the first act of, K of Color TV comes on uh, August 29th. Peter Carl Goldmark of CBS announces his invention of the color television system. The odd thing about that is NBC beat CBS to the punch as far as color TV. And it wasn't until the 1960s that uh, CBS finally had, around 1965, 1966, most of their shows in color. Uh, oh, how many of you like commercials? How many of you like commercials? That's a bull of a commercial. See, what they did was they took the Indian head test pattern 
and they fixed it up a little bit. They put numbers 12 through 11 on the test pattern, popped in NBC, popped out the Indian head, popped in RCA, and on the bottom there is Bulova, the first TV commercial, July 1st, 1940. Uh, it was at 2.29 in the afternoon when this history-making uh, event took place. It was on WNBT now, Channel One. It was 2.29 in the afternoon, and it preceded a Brooklyn Dodgers Philadelphia Phillies game on July 1st, 1940. The announcement for Boulevard displayed the WNBT test pattern, which was modified to look like a clock. Eventually, in animation, this was the Boulevard commercial. Pearl Harbor Day, December 7th, 1941. Ray Forrest of WNBT broadcasts a special news report concerning the Pearl Harbor attack and that knocked, knocked out a New York Rangers game, which was being shown that afternoon. WCBW Channel 2, the second station that came on in the United States, uh, they have a broadcast that evening from their Times, uh, rather their Grand Central Terminal Studios. Those studios are still there, not used much. Uh, April 1st, 1942, the U.S. Production, War Production Board ends the manufacturing of cable and radio equipment for consumer use. The ban would be lifted October 1st, 1945. During the war, uh, television stations could only show four hours a week of programming. But the war is over, and this guy would become a big star, but not quite after the war. Uh, Dumont Network, Dumont Network, uh, that's where Jackie Gleason cut his teeth on TV, the cavalcade of stars, it's where Joe the bartender and the poor soul and, and Ralph Cramden, of course, and, Reginald Van Gleeson and Fenwick Babbitt and the Loudmouth started on TV. On Dumont, and Dumont is a really interesting network uh, down at Montclair State University. Uh, there is the Dumont Studio, uh, and there's some artifacts from, from Dumont there. Not very much, not much survives. Uh, but uh, there is a studio that used to be used by Verizon. Verizon doesn't do news anymore. And um, you would go in there and they had a TV mocked up to where they showed Dumont programming, whatever it was that they could find, uh, as you walked into the lobby of the Dumont studio at Montclair State University. Dumont was the uh, world's pioneer commercial television network. They beat out NBC and CBS. Uh, they were number one. They started operation September 15th, 1946. And two weeks later or so, uh, they have the first television network soap opera, Faraway Hill, which was on Dumont. Didn't have many stations, but they had some programming. Um, some of that programming went elsewhere. Uh, Ted Mack's original amateur hour, which began on radio, Major Bose back in 19... 30s. Um, Ted Mack would be the guy on TV. Uh, the uh, Major Bowes uh, Amateur Hour, of which Frank Sinatra and, and Hoboken Ford never won. Maury Amsterdam had a show. Uh, Maury on the Dick Van Dyke show played Buddy Sorrell, created by Carl Reiner. And the Maury Amsterdam Buddy Sorrell character was based upon Mel Brooks's behavior during your show of shows. Of course, Carl Reiner was Mel Brooks' best friend. Captain Video and the Video Rangers. Uh, I was in Stamford, Connecticut doing this talk, and this woman said, ooh, ooh, ooh. I said, no, it's car 54. She said, uh-uh-uh. I want to tell you, my father bought me the helmet. They used to watch Captain Video with the helmet on. And then a couple of years later, I'm in New Jersey doing this talk, and this guy said, well, I used to have the helmet. I watched it with the helmet on. I don't know who got it for me, but I used to watch it. And the Arthur Murray Dance Party. Uh, Arthur Murray is, if COVID ever goes away, is supposed to open up a studio about four miles up the road from here. Uh, it was supposed to open up before COVID, and it still says coming soon, Arthur Murray. You can always tell Arthur Murray graduates. I, I speak on cruise ships, and you can tell them when they go on the dance floor, they have the proper steps to meet each other, bow to each other, and go dance away. And usually they have no rhythm, but they know all the moves. Uh, Ernie Kovacs, the father of... Um, uh, blackout comedy, um, quick hit comedy, which uh, you would see on Rowan and Martin's Laughing in 1968. Uh, Dumont was looking for talent wherever they could find it. And Ernie Kovacs was on a local station in Philadelphia. Dumont signs him up and uh, he gets a show on Dumont. 
Uh, Ernie still to this day makes me laugh. Uh, and I've seen one of these skits where he's a used car salesman, pounces his uh, hand on the, uh, uh, on the car, keeps pounding his hand um, on the front fender, and eventually the car falls through the floor. I don't know why, but I think it's funny all these years later. Um, Dumont's problem was they didn't have the reservoir of talent that, say, CBS had. They had Lucille Ball. They had Jack Benny, they had Ed Sullivan, NBC had Milton Berle, they had Sid Caesar. And back uh, in the early days of TV, uh, unless it was an owned and operated station by Bill Paley or by uh, Sarnoff, uh, NBC, CBS, or even Dumont, which owned Channel 8 in Pittsburgh, um, TV stations could choose and pick what shows they wanted. They could cherry pick. And more often than not, hey, let's take Lucy and Desi. Let's take Jack Benny. Let's take Sullivan. Let's take Burl. Let's take Sid Caesar. And uh, all Dumont could offer was a really unknown guy by the name of Jackie Gleason, unknown Bishop Fulton J. Sheehan. Uh, they didn't have recognizable names. They would eventually become recognizable names. Dumont had the uh, first news show from Washington, nightly news uh, show. Um, they were number one before CBS and uh, NBC. Uh, they had the first regularly scheduled children's show, The Small Fry Club, with Big Brother Bob Emery. And that was introduced into its daytime schedule long before, uh, how, well, not long before, but before Howdy Doody. And of course, uh, Ralph Cramden. And it was on the Dumont Network that Ralph first said, one of these days, Alice, one of these days, bang, zoom to the moon. Couldn't do that today. Verbal assault. But uh, it was popular back then. And look at Alice's look. Alice is like, yeah, you're going to do it. I dare you to do it. You're not going to do it. You're never going to do it. Of course, he never did. By the way, Alice uh, played here by Audrey uh, Meadows. The first Alice was played by Pearl Kelton. And um, she got caught up in the blacklisting and the House on Un-American Activities and Red Channel and all that. And Gleason had to let her go. Didn't want to let her go. Had to let her go. And he did slip money to her. She would eventually come back to Gleason in the 1960s when he did the show out of Miami and did the honeymooner skit. She played the mother-in-law. But uh, she was uh, a victim to uh, McCarthyism back in the 1950s, Red Channel, Hollywood Reporter, etc. So it was on uh, Dumont's Cavalcade of Stars that Ralph first threatens to send Alice to the moon, home of the first network soap opera, first network newscast in Washington. And well, let me let me get Howard to do this. Howard, get over here. Ron Arledge, get over here and tell them about the first prime time telecast of the National Football League back in 1951. Rune Arlich, the guy who brought you the uh, thrill of victory and the agony of defeat on the wide world of sports and brought you the Olympics uh, on ABC in the 1960s into the 1970s and hired people like Jim McKay, who was great during the Munich massacre. Or just, he was the perfect guy describing that. Cosell wanted to describe it. Uh, uh, but they made the right decision with uh, Jim McManus, Jim McKay. Uh, and also the guy who put together Monday Night Football, who conceived the Monday Night Football as an entertainment venue that happened to feature a game with Howard Cosell as the guy who would be the central character on the football game feuding with Don Meredith. But he breaks, uh, he cuts his teeth uh, in the broadcast business over at Dumont with the Saturday Night. National Football League Game of the Week or Saturday Night Football. So Dumont had Jackie Gleason before CBS, Bishop Sheen before ABC, the original Amateur Hour before NBC. Uh, but it was coming to an end. Dumont was a manufacturer of high quality television sets and equipment, but Dumont's, uh, Dumont and his people didn't know how to run a TV network. They really didn't. Uh, and now today they're primarily remembered as a purveyor of low budget programming, which is totally unfair because most television was rather low budget. Uh, in fact, the way they shot TV, kinescopes, you know, you took a camera in front of a TV and that's how you shot a TV show with the exception of some people like Jackie Gleason who put it on film and it was Desi Arnaz who was the first guy to put shows on film. Um, but anyway, um, CBS had a lot of low-budget programming. So did ABC, so did NBC, and 
certainly the local stations like Channel 9 in New York, which featured, ah, Joe Franklin. I knew Joe and I knew Richie Ornstein, his uh, long-suffering assistant. I was once up at 1440 Broadway at uh, Joe's office, and it was just like you would expect it. Place was filled with newspapers on the floor. Uh, and, uh, and Richie said, don't move any of them. He knows exactly where every one of them is. You didn't see the floor. All you saw were newspapers and magazines. The last non-sports program on Dumont, a game show called What's the Story? September 23rd, 1955. Dumont had some sports contracts. They ended up on uh, other networks. And uh, most of Dumont's programming now sits, what was left of the kinescopes uh, is at UCLA and other places. But most of the kinescopes that uh, Dumont had uh, now reside on the uh, bottom of the East River. There, was, uh, there were all kind of lawsuits going back and forth over money and all that other stuff. And finally, one lawyer got all fed up and he drives to the Bronx with a, a truck. They load all the kinescopes on the truck. They go to the East River, and right down uh, into the East River where they join the seventh series of the 1951 Topps baseball, uh, 1951 yeah, Topps baseball cards, which Mickey Mantle was in, which is why Cy Berger decided just to throw them all out because he didn't want to keep them in the warehouse. And that's why Mickey Mantle's 1951 rookie cards worth about a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, so it's down there with the Dumont shows. Now, how many of you ever heard of the name Penny Youngman? I have a friend, Bob Block, have a friend, Bob Block. He's 94 years old, lives in Reno, uh, Nevada now, and he's 94. Um, he was from Milwaukee, and uh, in the 1950s, uh, he was an advertising guy, and uh, you might have heard of two of his clients. One of them was a local uh, grocery store by the name of Kohl's, and the other was uh, Seelig's Ford car dealership and um, the father of Bud Seelig, who was the one-time commissioner of baseball. So he handled those accounts. Uh, he also owned a comedy club. And um, Bob, two of his best friends were uh, Henny Youngman and Maury Amsterdam. And uh, Henny Youngman went to his grave, according to Bob, who was good friends with him. He died a bitter man. And um, here's why. Well, here's part of the reason why. And I'm going to put you in Henny Youngman's shoes. Uh, around 1947, there were 44,000 TV sets in use. So nobody knew if TV was going to take off or not. Um, Henny's agent calls him and he says, uh, listen, Henny, NBC is going to move the Texaco Star Theater from radio to TV. Uh, and they're interested in, in you being the host of the show, a tryout, so to speak. But it happens to coincide with the same day you're giving the command performance before the royal family and Princess Elizabeth in London. Henny was from Liverpool. And um, so, listen, I don't, I'm not going to make that decision for you. You're going to have to make that decision. Do you do the show or do you do the TV show? We'll get back to that in a couple of minutes. Uh, because uh, I'm going to ask you, what's the longest running show on TV? And if you said meet the press, you win the cigar. Uh, that is Martha Roundtree. And uh, she was uh, the originator of uh, Meet the Press. That was on uh, Mutual Radio. I worked with Mutual Radio in the 1980s until they were absorbed by other people. Uh, and uh, by 1947, November 6, 1947, she moves the show, which she owned, uh, to NBC. And she is the first host of the show. Uh, later, she's joined by Lawrence Spivak, who would buy her out. She is the only permanent women, woman host of Meet the Press uh, in the history of the program, which is the longest running show in United States TV history. Back in those days, believe it or not, women had more juice in the business. They kind of lost in the 50s, 60s, 70s. You had Martha Roundtree, you had Claire Hollingsworth uh, over at the BBC in 1939. She was on the uh, border in Germany and Poland when Germany uh, invaded Poland. So she told the world that uh, there was Ruthie Gruber, who, uh, by the way, Claire Hollingsworth died a couple of years ago. She was 107. There was Ruthie Gruber, who died a couple of years ago. She was 102. She was the photojournalist, one of the first photojournalists who took pictures of the death camps in, in Germany. Uh, she was also responsible for what would eventually become the movie Oswego. 
uh, saving 1,000 Jews, getting them over to the United States, convincing Franklin Roosevelt that was the right thing to do. Um, and there was uh, Pauline Frederick, who was running around the Pacific Theater, who eventually would be on uh, television as well. And uh, so they had some pretty high profile uh, assignments. Uh, Meet the Press um, went from TV to radio to TV, and Lawrence Spivak would uh, buy out Martha, and Martha would go on to Dumont and do a similar show for Dumont. Oh, there is Ed Sullivan. My cousin's Jerry Stiller, and uh, Stiller and Mirror were on Ed's show 36 times. And uh, they were friendly with Ed. I wouldn't call them friends, but they were friendly with Ed. And Ed did a lot for their career. And Jerry has told me all kinds of stories about why he went like that, because he wanted to see what time it was to make sure the acts were going. And he was a ring announcer back in the 1920s uh, for the, while he's working for the New York Daily News as a sports writer. So when the microphone came down, he'd hold the microphone in that corner, in this corner, uh, and he raised his hand and all that other stuff. So what you, when you watch Toast of the Town or the Ed Sullivan Show, you're watching a guy from the 1920s who was a boxing ring announcer. And I'll, leave, I'll give you just one of Jerry's stories. I had a lot of them, but I'll just give you one of them. Um, Ed had something for everybody. Uh, you had uh, Topio Gigio, uh, or in my case, the Dancing Bears from the Moscow Circus, which was part of an exchange program between the US and USSR. So you had something for little kids. You had the Beatles for teenagers. You had uh, the Stephen Eadies and, and that type of entertainment for the younger adults. For the empty nesters, you had uh, Louis Armstrong and those people. And for the uh, seniors, you'd have uh, somebody like Jimmy Durante on. Uh, so he, he segmented the audience and he did it quite well. Uh, he also had Broadway stars come on on Sunday night because Broadway was dark. And uh, so Jerry's telling me the story. He's on with uh, Anna Marie Albregetti. He and Anne are on with uh, Anna Marie Albregetti. And uh, she sings a song, whatever show she was in, she sings a song. And uh, by the way, my wife was on uh, in summer stock with Anna Marie Albregetti in the 1970s. But anyway, so she's singing the song, and uh, you know she's done, and she gets you know one hand clapping, and Ed is getting furious because they're not giving the respect to Anna Marie Albregetti that he thought they should. So Ed starts yelling, "Come on, come on, let's hear it! Come on, let's hear it! Come on, let's hear it! Let's hear it! Let's hear it! Let's hear it for Albert Maria." You got to be in person to get that one. But that was a Sullivan Malaprop. But let's hear it for Anna Maria. Okay, back to Henny Youngman. Uh, that is the Texaco Star. That is a, a mock up of the Texaco gas station in the Henry Ford Museum. I, I speak on cruise ships. Uh, and uh, this particular one was a, a Great Lakes tour. And uh, we got to go to the Henry Ford Museum. And I said, I got to take this picture. It's perfect for the TV talk. And uh, so getting back to Bob Block, Henny Youngman. Um, so Henny Youngman, hey, let me ask you, let's see, let's, we got a couple of people here. If you want to put this in the box, you can put it in the box if you want. Um, so let me, uh, let me see if you want to answer the question. If you are Henny Youngman, do you um, take the royal gig or do you do the TV show? If anybody wants to answer, uh, I'll give you about 10 seconds. Uh, what would you do? Would you perform before Princess Elizabeth and her family? Or would you do the TV show? Um, I'll give you a couple seconds if you want to answer. Okay, no answers. Henny decides to do the royal performance because there's no future in TV. There is no future as far as he can tell. It's a crapshoot. And uh, let us take the, the uh, one that's a sure thing. Yes, he did. He did the royal performance. Uh, the guy who took his place that night, who was given the spot, was that guy, Milton Berle. And uh, yes, Berle did uh, the other. Now, um, I don't know how many of you went up to the Catskills during the glory days of the Catskills, but if you went up to Pines or Brickman or Cutcher's, you might have run into a guy by the name of Larry Strickler, who for the, he wasn't the tumor. Uh, Crazy Tyrone was the last tumor. Uh, Larry was the guy who did the, uh, who was the MC, who introduced everybody uh, in the shows. 
But Larry, who just celebrated his 80th birthday a couple of weeks ago, he's down in Florida now, and, and gives a lengthy talk about The Burl Show, was on The Burl Show as a child actor. And uh, we talked about it uh, at one, one day, and uh, he never knew the Bob Block story. And I told him the Bob Block story, and he said, it's kind of interesting. And he thought for a minute, and he says, Henny Youngman? No, he went to work. He said, Burl was perfect for that show, absolutely perfect for that show. Had a photographic memory. He was a perfectionist. He was a pain to work with because he wanted everything his way. But he said it produced results. It produced absolute results. And he said, you know, I'm a kid. Now, Larry's 80. So Larry started out on the show when he was eight years old and went up to about 13 on the show. And he said that, uh, you know, Milton was he, was, he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And he understood TV. He said, Henny Youngman, I can't picture Henny Youngman in a dress. Burl's show is credited with selling televisions. There were 500,000 TVs when he started the show in 1948, when he ended the show in 1950 and he had a lifetime contract with NBC. I only met him once up at 1700 Broadway in 1986. And we were in the same room together very briefly. Uh, I asked him what he was doing there. He was going through uh, the archives for a 60th anniversary show on radio. And I was doing a, a report for Jack O'Rourke over at NBC Sports. And so that's the only time I met Milton. He was very nice to me while we were up there. Uh, but um, he's credited. Of course, he wasn't the only one. Television was being added and added and added in various cities. Uh, but um, anyway, uh, the Texaco man, uh, yes, everyone, well, everyone of a certain age knows uh, you could trust the man, uh, the man who wears the star, the big red Texaco star. Uh, but um, other people, as cities came on, they bought TVs. And why they buy TVs? Well, partly to watch Milton Berle and partly to watch others, including uh, Lucy. Uh, the Texaco Star Theater was the highest rated television show of 5051, uh, the first season in which Nielsen's ratings were used. Now, in 1950, Ed Sullivan got some competition from NBC. It was called the Colgate Comedy Hour. And uh, among the people on that show, the hosts on that show, well, let's go from city to city. Uh, there's Joe Franklin's favorite performer of all time, the president of the Eddie Cantor fan club, Joe Franklin. He loved Eddie Cantor. But you see, the problem here with Eddie Cantor is making Whoopi was done, what, about 1931? And uh, all the other songs, Bye Bye Birdie, were done in the 1920s. And it was kind of, uh, you know, passe at this point for Eddie Cantor 20, 25 years later. Uh, Martin and Lewis, they're beginning to go the other way slightly. Uh, it isn't the glory days of the Paramount and when uh, people are uh, just out in front of the hotel screaming and yelling, hoping to get a look at uh, Dean and Jerry. But they're in Los Angeles and they, they do kind of well in the ratings. They don't, Abbott and Costello. And the reason why they're in Chicago and uh, three cities, New York, Chicago, L.A., uh, they are totally overexposed. Uh, Abbott and Costello, they have the movies. Of course, you can't escape who's on first or Niagara Falls. Uh, they're still on radio, and uh, they even have a television show, and they're just thoroughly, thoroughly overexposed at this point, and they didn't draw the people in. However, this show is uh, instrumental in television because it's the first show that originated from three different areas, thanks to some of this, coaxial cable. Um, there were three remote production units set up, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles. And there was a combination of coaxial cable and microwave interconnections, which allowed the live telecast. Uh, I was at uh, the Arbor House in, our, in, T in Teaneck, New Jersey, senior home. And uh, there was a guy who was an engineer, who was a television engineer. There was also William Paley's CPA, who also lived there, both from the 50s. They were in their 90s. And he tried to explain to me how that all worked. And I said, hey, listen, listen, I'm talent. You know what they say about talent. Last to know, first to go. And he looked at me and he said, you got it right. But he told me it was an engineering marvel. Uh, and it helped television, um, at least in the United States starting with remotes and eventually see person to person with Edward R. Morrow. Uh, if you lived in Scarsdale, New York, you knew where Buffalo Bob Smith lived because he had a big totem pole right in front of his house and there was always a crowd in front of his house 
of Little Kids. And that is Buffalo Bob Smith and, of course, Howdy Doody. That show starts in 1947 on December 27, 1947. It would last until 1960, and it would be one of the first shows ever in color. First kitty show ever in color. Why? It was on NBC. And on NBC, or NBC is owned by RCA, the Radio Corporation of America, and they are a manufacturer of televisions. And they want to sell televisions. And what better, how better to do it? Selling TVs, color TVs, to a kid's audience. Because a kid will nag a parrot. I want to call TV. I want to call TV. I want to call TV. No, none of that, that green screen stuff that you stuck on the screen and maybe a color would bounce off. And I, I don't know how many of you remember putting a green screen on the TV thinking that you were going to get color. Uh, but um, that was the first. And Clarabelle the Clown, the first Clarabelle the Clown played by Bob Keeshan, who became Captain Kangaroo. Um, I don't know how many of you remember a setup like this. I do. I was on the Lower East Side and uh, I would go north of uh, Essex Street onto Avenue A with my mother and um, she'd go shopping there on Avenue A and there'd be an appliance store like that. And in the appliance store, there would be TVs and there would be people as late as 1964 crowding around the, uh, the, the uh, outside of an appliance store gawking at TV. Now, I don't know exactly when this picture was taken, but I surmise it was taken in the fall. And I think these guys are either watching the World Series, a college football game, or a National Football League game. Look at the woman behind there in the kerchief. She doesn't care what's going on. But you used to see that's where you went to buy your TVs in an appliance store. Ah, I hate that when that happens. Hang on one second here. Hang on. Okay, I fixed it. Now, it is claimed that the first cable television system in the United States was created in 1948 in Mahoney City, near Allentown. I did this talk uh, in Allentown uh, a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, the librarian had no idea about uh, John Walson uh, and uh, his creation. Let me get back to Allentown. Uh, anyway, so uh, it's Mahoney City, right outside of Allentown, and Mahoney City should have been getting the signal of three Philadelphia TV stations, Channel 3, KYW, WFIL, which was Channel 6 in Philadelphia, and Channel 10 in Philadelphia, WCAU. Except there was a mountain called Stone Mountain, which blocked Mahoney City. So if you did get a signal uh, from Philadelphia, it was going to be really, really weak. And John Walson's trying to sell televisions at his uh, show, at his store. So he kind of figures out something. He's going to experiment. Maybe if I put an antenna on top of a mountain and run all kind of wiring, uh, there is John Walson. My friend Frank Carney worked for him in the 1970s and 1980s as a cable TV lobbyist in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. He became a cable TV executive. Anyway, so he goes up to the mountain and he kind of runs this you know, heavy duty twine leaded army surplus wire that he gets at a local store. So he runs the wire on the trees from the mountain into his appliance store. He puts the antenna up there, plants it, and puts the, the, gets the wires into uh, his appliance store. And voila, you can see channel three, you can see channel six, you can see channel 10. And Walson gets an idea. It's customers, come in, come in, come in. Look, 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 you can see TV. Well, how do you get TV? Well, I, all I have to do is run this wire. Yeah, I will buy the TV. And with that, it is thought that community antenna TV or cable TV in uh, 1948 is, uh, founded in Mahoney City, Mahoney City, Pennsylvania. But there's another story, and that's me. And I'm in Astoria, Oregon. And this is uh, the summer of uh, 2018, the middle of July. Never gets above 62 degrees in Astoria, Oregon. It's right at the end of the, uh, where it's where the Columbia River meets the Pacific Ocean. And you've got the marine layer there. The layer eventually will burn off and, and you'll have two hours of sunshine. Uh, but anyway, so I'm in Astoria, and my daughter lives in Seattle. She said, wait, we've never gone to Oregon, or you've never gone to Oregon, so once we go down. So uh, we get to Astoria, 
and there's a train that is a mile and three quarters. It takes you from one end of Astoria to the other end of Astoria. It's just a mile and three quarters. So, uh, and it's to restore the old cars from the 19 teens. And so you get on the train and then you go through and, and they tell you what the landmarks are. And they said, that's where cable TV was started. I said, no, it started in the Poconos. I said, no, listen to our story. And I looked up the story and their story was correct. There was a guy by the name of Ed Parsons. He ran the local radio station in Astoria, uh, where his radio antenna was at the top of the highest point, which is that building in the back. And um, he knew a little bit about TV signals, 19, or rather radio signals. In 1946, he goes to a radio convention in Chicago with his wife, Grace, and she sees TV. There it is, WKBK, Channel 2 in Chicago, and she gets the TV bug and she gets it bad. But there are no TV stations in Seattle. I don't know how they ended up with the TV, but they ended up with the TV. And they, there's a station that starts in Seattle, KRSC. And it's 80 miles away. It's a stretch. But uh, Ed Parsons decides he's going to play around with his antenna, uh, you know, for his radio station and see if he can pull in the signal. And he pulls in the signal. And um, it was the TV was down at the uh, in the office, so he's using coaxial cable. So he calls his wife, Grace. Guess what? We have a TV. We do. Come to the office. She comes to the office, and there it is, the TV. And she says, "Can we have it in the house?" And he says, "Yeah, I think we could have it in the house. Uh, let me let's let's run the the wires to the house, which wasn't that far away. And yeah, they have uh, t they, the wires work and." have uh, TV in the house. The fatal flaw comes. Grace Parsons decides to tell everybody in the neighborhood, guess what we got? We got TV. And poor Ed Parsons loses his kitchen, loses his dining room, loses his living room, loses his bathroom, loses his mind. So he's got to get all these people out of his house. And how's he going to do this? How's he going to do? Oh, let's see if Let's get another TV, he gets another TV. He's got one in his house, one in his office, and he splits the wires. They work. Hey, let's tell all the neighbors, go buy a TV. Go buy a TV. You go buy a TV, and uh, I guarantee you, you'll get TV out of Seattle. They do. $3 a month. He's making $36 a year from his neighbors with pirate, what would is really pirate TV he's stealing the signal, although it's a free signal, but he's stealing the signal and uh, they're paying for it. He never told the FCC because if he did and they did an investigation, uh, Ed Parsons would probably have lost his radio license. But then again, who cares? It's uh, Astoria, Oregon, and how many people live in Astoria? There are 11,000 that live there right now, so uh, and you know, nobody. <laughs> Yeah, nobody really wants to uh, vacation there. There are nicer places. Um, if you don't like, if you like marine layers, it's a great place. Uh, on uh, 1948, May 3rd, CBS TV, the television news debuts with Douglas Edwards. Uh, June 21st, first network telecast of political conventions in Philadelphia and the BBC. July 29th, 1948, coverage of the Olympic Games in London. Uh, Lucy, Lucy, explain. Uh, by 1950, William Paley wanted Lucy, who is a radio star, on um, his network and um, do a show. And it would star Lucy. Uh, and she'd be married. But she wouldn't be married to Desi Arnaz. Problem. Lucille Ball says, it's either Desi or nothing. And eventually, Paley gives in. And they're the first interracial couple on television in the United States. Uh, the I Love Lucy show starts in 1951. I have a whole separate talk about Lucy, the businesswoman, and all these things that happened to her en route to becoming the most powerful businesswoman in Hollywood. Uh, Jack Benny. I love the Jack Benny show. TV show, I could take or leave. It wasn't all that good. My opinion. That's just my opinion. Uh, Benny... Um, was great on radio. Radio is the theater of the imagination. You had to imagine the Benny character. He was 56 years old 
when he gets to TV and uh, you were better off with the imagination. He also had a radio show that went to TV. The one, the only Groucho, say the secret word and win 50 bucks, 100 bucks. There's Fenneman, the long suffering announcer or the male Margaret Dumont. Uh, the show starts on radio and ends up on TV. Now this story may or may not have happened Groucho said it did, Groucho said it didn't. It certainly didn't happen on TV, but it might happen on radio. Fenneman introduces, George Fenneman that is, introduces Marion and Charlotte's story to Groucho. Marion and Charlotte's story have 20 children. And uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Story, Groucho Marx, Groucho Marx, Mr. and Mrs. Story. Groucho said, asks, uh, why did you choose to raise such a large family? Mrs. Story is said to have replied, I love my husband, to which Groucho allegedly responded, I love my cigar, but I take it out of my mouth once in a while. There was a woman in Terrytown. I was a, speaking in Terrytown, married couple, and the woman's going like that to her husband. What does he mean by that? What does he mean by that? I said, I'm not telling you. I'm not married. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you later. They've been married about 60 years. She should have known. I Love Lucy, um, uh, you know, the grape stomping and, and the candy factory and all their legendary uh, uh, episodes. Uh, a guy by the name of Sw uh, <laughs> Swanee, Sigourney Weaver's father, Sylvester Pat Weaver, started the late night television show. It's called Broadway Open House. And uh, it's the template for the modern day comedy shows that uh, whether it was Steve Allen or uh, Jack Parr or Johnny Carson or Merv Griffin or Dick Cavett, um, this is where all it originates from. Uh, it's co-hosted by Jerry Lester and Maury Amsterdam. Maury would leave the show, Lester would become the host, and he's left with a woman by the name of Jenny Lewis who he decides to call Dagbar. I was in Glen Cove a couple of years ago, and there was this guy in his 90s, and he starts panting. <sighs> and I figure, hey, there must be something wrong. I said, what's wrong? He said, oh, nothing. She was the best, best, best breather on TV. There was another guy in Long Island who was like, mm, mm. I said, what's wrong? He said, Dagmar, Dagmar, Dagmar. I said, okay, Dagmar. Well, apparently Dagmar was the uh, Kim Kardashian of her era. She only had two major assets. But they were enough to put the show over the top. She went from $75 a week to $1,250 a week salary uh, by uh, being the sidekick or the Kim Kardashian of Broadway Open House. That show only lasted two years, but she became immensely popular and very impressionable in modern culture of the 1950s because take a look at that coup de ville. Um, it's a new coup de ville, or a 1956 Chevrolet. It's a new Chevrolet. Uh, for some reason, take a look at those bumpers. Um, there's no reason for those bumpers other than style. And they were nicknamed the Dagmar bumpers. Some engineer thought it would be cool to have the Dagmar bumpers at GM. And there is Dagmar. And there is, there are the two. Dagmar bumpers put on uh, a number of General Motors cars, including the Cadillac Coup de Ville. Bum, ba, bum, 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 ba, bum, 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 The story of Pepsi is true, only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet started in 1951. It lasted eight years. It was enduring. Version 2, in color, returned in 1967 and ended in 1970. There was supposed to be a version 3 in the 1980s, but Jack Webb died of a heart attack as they were putting together the show. Dragnet had high ratings, a recognizable theme song, and Sergeant Joe Friday, who was immortalized in a Stoller and Lieber song club, searching along with Charlie Chan, Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and other uh, crime stoppers or crime chasers. Um, and there he is. Just the facts, man. Just the facts. Badge 714. Uh, Joe Friday. Uh, the Today Show started in 1952 and has not changed. It is still the same show it was in 1952. Well, Dave Garraway is long gone. J. Fred Muggs is still alive. He lives in Tampa, uh, living the life of, uh, of a regal, uh, former chimpanzee on TV. Uh, 1952, the Today Show blended national news headlines, interviews with newsmakers, lifestyle features, light news, gimmicks, local news updates, 
uh, local weather updates uh, from the network stations it has not changed except it's now four hours instead of two hours. Uh, National Educational TV starts around uh, 1954, actually it starts in 1952 uh, with a grant uh, from the Ford Foundation's Fund for Adult Education, but it gets going May 16th, 1954 at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, co-owned by, or well, it was owned by the Ford Foundation and later co-owned by the uh, Corporation for Bub Public Broadcasting. They actually didn't produce shows. They were a show uh, exchange with other stations and would be Fred Rogers, who basically would save uh, federal funding uh, for uh, educational TV in the 1960s when he went before Congress and uh, Congressman said to him, uh, show us why you need the money. And Fred gave a, a stirring uh, pep talk and he got the money. Uh, originally, it was just an exchange and distribution um, service. Uh, the company would move to uh, New York from Ann Arbor in 1958 and then produce programming. Uh, every city, it seemed, had a romper room. Romper, stomper, bumper, boo, tell me, tell me, tell me, who are you? I didn't particularly like romper room. It wasn't kind of for me. But anyway, uh, that's Miss Joan. Uh, and that's Mr. Doobie, who you might or might not remember. Romper Room was a children's television series, started in 1953, lasted till 1994, created, produced by Burke Claster. His wife, Nancy, was the presenter, and uh, she would train the hostesses from uh, other uh, cities uh, who bought the franchise. It opened up with the greeting from the hostess, and then the Pledge of Allegiance, and then I seem to remember, do be this and don't be that, and all that other stuff. I remember the mirror at the end where they did all kind of effects and the mirror had, <laughs> you could see through the mirror after that. Uh, the uh, Steve Allen Show, The Tonight Show with Steve Allen um, comes next. It features people like Don Knotts and Louis Nye and Tom Poston. Uh, the Man on the Street featured Don Knotts, the prototype for Barney Fife, Nervous Mr. Morrison. Tom Poston was the man who couldn't remember his own name. Pat Harrington, the Italian golfer named Guido Panzini, Louis Nye, the smug Gordon Hathaway, and Bill Dana uh, as Jose Jimenez. My name is Jose Jimenez, who was the first uh, uh, ast Hispanic astronaut. The uh, Mercury astronauts loved him, absolutely loved him. But Bill dropped uh, the whole act in 1972. Uh, a friend of mine, the late Shelley Saltman, um, grew up uh, with Bill and his brother up in uh, Boston. His brother uh, ended up being a doctor and Bill ended up becoming an actor. Elvis sung to a hound dog on the Steve Allen show. Elvis didn't particularly care to dress up uh, and sing to a basset hound, but he did. He ain't nothing but a hound dog. Jack Parr, Jack Parr took the show over from Steve Allen, lasted about five years once got suspended for telling a joke about a WC, a water closet. Dick Clark, America's eternal teenager, becomes a, uh, the host of Bandstand in 1956. October 7th, 1952, WFIL-TV Philadelphia premiered the series Bandstand, become American Bandstand. And uh, the emphasis is, was on teenagers dancing to popular records. Uh, in Norwood, New Jersey, I gave a talk and this woman was telling me about how her brother was one of the dancers that they picked him up in the limousine and she had to wait outside uh, to get inside while he was uh, given a limousine. Uh, Dick Clark becomes the host in 1956, the very week American Broadcasting Company picks up the show in 1957. They were looking for anything they called their 14 affiliates. You have something for us? Yeah, bandstand. They picked it up, the rest is history. This is what happens in the 1950s, you know? Oh, wait, oh, it's my wife. It's Disneyland. It's 1982. What is this doing here? 1982, the Magic Kingdom and all my wife. Oh, I'll tell you what. See, in the mid 1950s, Walt Disney is thinking about getting into the amusement park business. Although there were amusement parks everywhere. I lived in Queens and there were two uh, within Woodside. They were small, but they had all the rides that you wanted. And you went around places, ride Playland, other places, it was there. So Disney's trying to come up with uh, money to build an amusement park. And he wants to get Hollywood involved. And uh, he's getting doors slammed in his face, door after door after door. Now, 
ABC has 14 affiliates when Disney goes around looking for money. CBS is 74. They're making money. NBC, 71. They're making money. ABC is just hanging on, owned by Paramount. Uh, but something, there's a chord struck between Paramount, who's looking for something in Walt Disney. And Paramount says, we'll give you money to build that amusement park 40 miles south of LA in the Anaheim Orange Groves. But you got to do something for us. This is going to be the exchange. We want two shows. And there, of course, uh, the mouse that roared, uh, Mickey Mouse, the uh, house the mouse built. Um, Disneyland and Mickey Mouse, those were the two shows that they wanted. And ABC would become profitable. And uh, with that money, we just lost everything. Why did we lose everything here? Uh, with that, money. We're going to have to uh, get back to uh, where we were there. With that money, uh, the uh, Disney people were able to uh, uh, build, uh, build the place. I'm still looking to get back here. There we go. We're back here. They built the place and uh, they got two hit shows uh, from uh, Walt Disney. Uh, and with that money, they were able to buy TV shows from Desi Lou, The Untouchables, and that was picked out by Lucille Ball. Uh, over at CBS, Rod Serling, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone, Serling used storytelling to explore the human condition and culture of his time, 52 to, 59 to 64. I was once in the audience, Dick Cavett show, watching him and, and Cavett talk, and uh, I don't think they were talking to us. I think they were talking to each other. Hey, if you were in the New York area, you might remember that guy. That's the late Sonny Fox. He passed away two months ago from COVID. That's me and him eight months ago. Uh, there were uncle shows. Uh, the uncle shows, the last one was Uncle Floyd uh, in New Jersey on Channel 68. The uncles wanted to have a smooth show, and they were interrupted by people, people like me once. Uh, way back in the day, and they never had smooth shows. In New York, you might have on Channel 5 watched Sandy Becker and Giba Giba and Norton Nork and the Perf Big Professor and Bugs Bunny cartoons. On Channel 5, Joe Bolton and the Three Stooges, Captain Jack and Popeye. Channel 11 also had Chuck McCann for a while. He went to Channel 5, uh, and he did Laurel and Hardy and Little Orphan Annie and Soupy Sales. Uh, and uh, his show on uh, Channel 5 and the New Year's Eve show in 1964, 1965 New Year's Day show where he told uh, the kids to go into their parents' room. Uh, he had 40 seconds to kill, and he said, uh, hey, you know, you go in and uh, your mother's pocketbook might be there or your father's wallet tiptoe in there. They may be sleeping because they had too much of a party last night. And if you see these green pieces of paper with funny looking people on it, um, send them to me and I'll send you a postcard from Puerto Rico. Uh, he got $80,000 doing that. He had to return most of it. And uh, Sonny Fox told me it caused a problem at Channel 5 because they were going to fire him. They suspended him and they got all these letters from his fans. So they kept him. Uh, you couldn't do this show today, your show of shows. If Gene Cochran said, Caesar, the reason why, how are you going to pay these people? Uh, I don't know, Mel Bro Mel Com Melvin Kaminsky, ever hear of him? Mel Bro I, don't, I don't think he ever did anything. But Neil Simon did, Danny Simon did, Mel Tonkin, Lucille Kalin, Selma Diamond, Joseph Stein, Michael Stewart, Tony Webster, Carl Reiner, Larry Gelbart, and Woody Allen were all writers. You couldn't pay them. Uh, enough money to uh, one of them to write a show. They probably got about 500 bucks a show then, if that much. Nat King Cole was on, and Nat King Cole had a big problem. He never got a sponsor, a national sponsor. Uh, Nat King Cole once said that's because Madison Avenue was afraid of the dark. He also called himself the Jackie Robinson of TV, but he really wasn't. Uh, there were uh, other African Americans that preceded him that uh, hosted the show. Uh, Hazel Scott, pianist and singer on Dumont, and uh, Billy Daniels. Uh, there were no national sponsors for Nat King Cole. Local sponsor in New York was Rheingold Beer, also in Hartford, Coca-Cola in Houston, Regal Beer in New Orleans, Gallo Wine and Colgate Toothpaste in Los Angeles. The last show, which you could see, it's up on YouTube, December 17th, 1957. Uh, he sings The Party Is Over. Uh, Singer Sewing Machine Company wanted the 8 o'clock Tuesday night time slot that Nat King Cole was on. 
Um, David Sarnoff said he wanted to keep Cole Saturday night, seven o'clock. Cole said no, people didn't watch TV then. Hazel Scott, Juilliard graduate, actress. Uh, she was a great piano player, pianist. Uh, her singing was okay, it wasn't great, but her piano playing was off the chart. Um, she gets a show on Dumont and the House on Un-American Activities outs her out as a communist. And she decides to go uh, in front of the uh, House on Un-American Activities to clear her name. Uh, she does, uh, all the sponsors drop out, Dumont drops her show very quickly after that. She's in 20 years worth of exile. Uh, in Europe and comes back, and she's on General Hospital when she comes back. Uh, TV had a lot of ethnicity back uh, in the early days. Uh, there was a show that featured Italians. I remember Mama was about a Norwegian family, the Irish family. You had all kinds of things going on. That would quickly end. The Bueller Show jumped over from radio to TV, ABC, a week network, lasted two years. Ethel Waters and Hattie McDaniel were two of the four. Bueller's, the queen of the kitchen, they lasted two years. Amos and Andy made the jump from radio to TV, from WGN Radio to CBS TV, and they were real successful when they started out. There were two years worth of episodes, 52 in all total, sponsored by Blatt's Brewery of Milwaukee. The TV show used black actors. The uh, radio show was white actors. But the NAACP didn't like anything that was going on with Amos and Andy, didn't like the characters, didn't like anything. And they said, we're going to boycott the show. Uh, 13th in the ratings in 51-52, 25th in 52-53. Uh, but the boycott got Blatt's beer, and they ended its advertising support in June of 1953. And that was the end of that. Uh, and they put uh, African-American actors out of business. Uh, some of the women on TV, see the USA, drive your Chevrolet, Dinah Shore. And Betty White, KNBH, Los Angeles, now KNBC, Los Angeles. Eve Arden, Armis Brooks. Uh, my little Margie, Gail Storm. Ann Southern, executive secretary. The Donna Reed Show. Donna Reed was the first woman who was really the boss of the household. December Bride, Spring Byington. Uh, Yoo-hoo, Mrs. Goldberg, Gertrude Berg. The show goes from radio over to TV, and it's one of the first victims of Red Channels, the Red Scare. Uh, because that guy on the left, Philip Loeb, is outed as a communist. And there are a lot of there's a lot of pressure on Gertrude Berg, the first situation comedy on TV. She creates the character Marley Goldberg to get rid of Philip Lowe because he's been accused of being a communist. She refused, refused, refused until she couldn't refuse anymore. Uh, no Philip Lowe, the show stumbles on NBC in Dumont and crashes to an end. Uh, Philip Lowe would eventually commit suicide. And if you want more on that, you probably in the library can pick up a book on, from Zero Mostel. Uh, and or the movie Blacklist, and uh, basically that will tell you a lot about Philip Loeb and the blacklisting of the 1950s. Uh, Arthur Duncan was a tap dancer on the Lawrence Welk show from 64 to 72, but he was on the Betty White show in the 1950s, in 1954. Betty is called in for a meeting with the network execs and the, and, uh, the sponsors, and they said, Betty, we love your show. We don't like Arthur Duncan. And Betty said, if you don't like Arthur Duncan, you don't like me. That was the end of the Betty White show. Oh, the fair on TV, Westerns, Playhouse 90, Cowboys and Indians, Gary Moore at three shows, a daytime show, a nighttime show featuring Carol Burnett. And, what, and uh, I've got a secret, Art Linkletter, soap operas, variety shows. Some odd things in the 1950s. Uh, Lucy was pregnant, but you couldn't say that she was pregnant. Lucille Ball's pregnant, can't say pregnant on TV. CBS censors say, hey, the word pregnancy is too obscene. They were married on the show and in real life. TV parents were shown underneath covers in separate beds. They were worrying about offending somebody. I don't know who they were worried about, but they were. And then there was Mary Tyler Moore. Now, Lucy wore pants, but she was Lucy. And here is Mary Tyler Moore. That's Bob Crane in the back there, who would eventually become uh, Hogan and Hogan's heroes. And uh, Mary Tyler Moore creates quite a stir. I had Laura wear pants in the Dick Van Dyke show because I said women don't wear full skirt dresses to vacuum in. 
CBS said, you know, we're afraid that the housewives are going to be a little annoyed because she looks so good in pants. Well, Carl Reiner has to get there. He creates the story, uh, the show. And, uh, you know, Carl Reiner says, okay, okay, that's it. And she's not going to wear pants. But she eventually started wearing pants. And that was the end of that. I know why we had to please stand by, because he came on Maynard G. Krebs, the first beatnik ever on TV. Perfect portrayal. Max Shulman created it, and Bob Denver did the perfect portrayal. Goatee, ripped t-shirt, love of jazz, uses the like vocab vocabulary. Perfect for the beat generation or beatniks. Uh, quiz show scandals, um, basically shows were rigged um, because they wanted to make the shows more interesting to viewers. Uh, Jack Barry was one of the guys who rigged the show. Uh, in uh, one of his shows, it was Herbert Stemple who went to Jack O'Brien of the New York Journal American who blew the whistle, said he took the dive. Uh, there were grand juries that were out. Congress uh, decided to have hearings on all this, and Congress would amend the Communications Act in 1934, which prohibited the fixing of quiz shows. Bob Barker did Truth or Consequences, not a quiz show. Game shows uh, have more regulatory rules than new shows to assure legitimacy. And this all caused more pro uh, Griffin a problem. He had hosted uh, Play Your Hunch, a Goodson Todman show for five years, and wanted to branch out into uh, his own game show production. And he wanted to do a quiz show. And he's riding with his wife, Jillian, one day. And they say, you know, I don't know how to do this, you know, with quiz shows and all that. And, you know, with the questions and all. And Jillian says, give them the answers. And Murph says, huh? Give them the answers. 5,280 feet. What's a mile? See? This is Jeopardy. Starts in 1964. It's off the air for a few years and has been on uh, syndication for the last 37 years. John Cameron Swayze became the anchor man, 1949, the first anchor man. The makers of Camel Cigarettes bring you the world's latest news events right into your own living room. Sit back, light up a camel, and be an eyewitness to the happenings that made history in the last 24 months. Except there was a problem. R.J. Reynolds was the sponsor. And uh, NBC News had to uh, play ball with R.J. Reynolds. Uh, so NBC News had uh, reports that weren't allowed to show no smoking signs. And there was only one person who could smoke a cigar during their reports. That was Winston Churchill. And R.J. Reynolds said, uh-uh-uh, no coverage of the Korean War. Edward R. Morrow would bring down Joe McCarthy. He'd do it in two parts. See it now, March 9th, 1954. The report on Senator McCarthy and all the shenanigans uh, with the communists and the Red Scare and all that other stuff. And McCarthy wanted some equal time. Big mistake. Big, big mistake. Uh, and he does get equal time uh, on April 6, 1954, where Morrow goes head to head with McCarthy and eviscerates him. Uh, Morrow could not use CBS money to promote the show or use the CBS I logo. The show used uh, McCarthy's words against him, and uh, McCarthy would slide downhill, although uh, the Red Scare would continue long after McCarthy was around into 1960. And Morrow eventually would uh, be clipped by 1960, his last show, The Harvest of Shame, about California migrant workers, which 61 years later looks fresh today. Uh, TV, 1960, things change here with the Kennedy-Nixon debate. Uh, I knew Nixon. I, I, I did know him. He had no sense of humor. Uh, I dealt with Nixon from uh, 85 to 89. He settled the uh, baseball umpire's dispute uh, in 1985, and uh, yeah, I used to see him around. Uh, hello, President Nixon. Uh, uh, call me Dick. Call me Dick. And you could call me Evan, which he did. Anyway, take a look at that picture. John Kennedy, perfect suit, perfect hair. The suit matches the backdrop on color TV. And look at Nixon. He looks like he has been on the IRT on July 23rd, 1960. It's 97 degrees outside. The humidity is about 94%. He is in the subway, packed in like a sardine, where it's got to be 125 degrees, no air conditioning. His suit is wrinkled. He's got a five o'clock shadow. He's sweating. He had a knee injury. This is the first time that people said, does he look presidential? And if you look, Nixon doesn't. Kennedy looks cool, calm, and collective. Nixon doesn't. 
Uh, I listened to this back in college on radio and watched it on TV at the Mawa Library. And it's a tale of two, diff of two debates. Kennedy wins the TV debate because you can't keep your eyes off of him. He looks great. Nixon wins it on radio because you're not seeing the visuals. It's a theater of the imagination. TV matures in the 1960s uh, because of the visuals. And finally, it's does he look presidential? This guy, Newton Minow, Newton Minow, he's uh, Kennedy's head of the FCC. Oh, and that's the skipper of Gilligan's Island ship that was shipwrecked, the SS Minow. Hmm. Minnow and Minnow, and that, of course, is the skipper who shipwrecked the Minnow. Gilgan's Island TV boat was named for Newt Minnow. 1961, uh, Minnow uh, gave the vast wasteland speech about TV. The uh, executive producer and creator of Gilligan's Island thought that uh, Minnow was ruining television, hence the SS Minnow. And we end with Lucy. Lucille Ball in Star Trek, going where no man has ever gone before, even though they had women with them. And there is uh, the Vulcan, uh, half Vulcan, uh, Lenny Nimoy, Spock, and Shatner, who is just 90 years old. Now, who was the first Trekkie? She was. Lucille Ball. She's the head of the studio, Desi Lu, and she's the most powerful businesswoman in Hollywood by the mid 1960s. And there are two show proposals that come to her desk. One is for Mission Impossible, the other for Star Trek. Uh, the board of directors at uh, Desi Lu says, uh, nah, no Star Trek. Mission Impossible gonna be a hit, let's fund it. The other one, no. Lucy says, wait a minute, I'm the boss. I say fund it. Initially, she thought that uh, Star Trek was about USO performers going from Navy, Navy base to Army base to Air Force base, and, you know, military bases. And then Gene Roddenberry came in and said, no, it's, it's a wagon train in space, basically. Oh, okay. Uh, so she puts up money for the first pilot. Uh, the first pilot uh, doesn't really work. It's called the cage and it flops. But NBC says, hey, can we do this again? Well, what do you mean, can we do this again? Uh, we like that guy with the pointed ears. Uh, Spock, can we do that? Yeah, sure. Um, so they send uh, over um, the proposal to Desi Lu, and boy, they're direct. No, 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 not gonna do it, not gonna do it. And Lucy said, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it. We're gonna do it, and we did it, where no man has ever gone before. Star Trek, it's on for three years. She's gone by the time that they cancel the show. But Star Trek, movies, other TV shows, that franchise has got to be worth a couple billion dollars. And it was Lucy who made the decision to do it, even though everybody said, don't do it. Lucy knew talent. That's one thing she knew. Lucy said, do the untouchables. Lucy told Carol Burnett, do a variety show. Lucy was really good at spotting talent. And she thought that Star Trek, or Where No Man Has Gone Before, was a winner. Took a long time, but it was a winner. Thank you for inviting me to the library. Um, and uh, anybody who has any questions or comments, now is your time, because I am done speaking. So uh, any questions, any comments? My first love when I was a kid was this show called Juvenile Jury. Juvenile Jury. That was a kitty, that was a, what was that, a Saturday afternoon show? I or Saturday was, morning? I think it was in the evening, was Jack Barry talking to little kids? Oh, or was it, yeah, okay. So who's talking, who's talking, is that Norma? Yes. Hi Norma, how are you doing? Hi, fine. I love that show and I have been able to watch clips from it over the years, there are still some. They give the kids a problem and they say, solve it. And these little kids who were from, I guess, five years old up have all these interesting comments about world affairs. It's hilarious. Do you remember uh, it? I vaguely remember it. Um, I was born in 1956, so that Weird. probably was a little before, because Jack Berry was thrown off the air 
because the quiz show scandals. I am. He was gone from like 58 to about 67. Is that the Winky Dink show? I remember the Winky Dink show. You put the uh, the screen over the TV, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. And remember John Nagy? Oh, learn to draw. Yeah, he had the beard. Yes. Yeah, he had oh the God. beard and uh, the amazing Randy and, and a whole bunch of others. How about the uh, early Saturday morning show with first it was sneezing Billy Gilbert and then it was Andy Devine? Yeah, that was probably a little before my <laughs> time. I do remember Sunrise Semester and oh. uh, David, Davy and Goliath. I remember that. Um, and I remember TV used to come on with the snow and then the pet test pattern and then the national anthem and then the shows. I have a question for you, Evan. Yes. Because you know about how the, not necessarily only the programs, but also how it appeared to us. When you looked at something like Playhouse 90, it had more an immediate effect as if you were in a theater yeah. than, than, than did a TV. How did they do that? They just shot it live. Shot live in the studio. You know, and then what were we up. seeing? We, we weren't seeing the live production at 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, you were. No kidding. You were because, you know, on the West Coast, you probably didn't because they had the kinescope. Uh, but yeah, I mean, everything was live back in those days. Uh, the, guy yeah. who changed, the guy who changed everything was Desi Arnaz um, because <clears throat> he decided to put the Lucy show on film. And, um, and, and they own the show, actually. CBS didn't own the show. They own the show. And what he really did, and, and I'll tell you where Lucy is real smart, too. What he really did was uh, by putting it on film, he preserved those shows uh, so they could be shown 60, 70, 80 years later, and they could still make money off of those shows. Yeah. What Lucy did in the mid-1960s, I think it was the Here's Lucy show, uh, one of those shows. Uh, CBS wasn't doing color TV. And she shot the shows in color because she thought the shows would be more valuable when they were syndicated and make her more money or Desi Lou or whatever. Uh, and they'd be more viable as uh, in color, even though they weren't shown uh, first run in color. Uh, so she, she was really, you know, for somebody who had no background, no business background. She was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And, you know, Lucy, I mean, the thing with Lucy was she was a failure as an actress. They told her you weren't going to be an actress. She was a cigarette uh, picture model. And she got into a Three Stooges short. And she learned to take a pie in the face and seltz her up the nose. And that changed her entire career. Three Stooges. Do you remember when there was a million dollar movie and the late show and the late, late show? Yeah, the million dollar movie, I think, was uh, like six different movies, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. It's sort of like in repertory almost. Yeah, six, six yeah. different movies. And, uh, and the theme song was from where? The Syncopated Clock. No, the Syncopated no. Clock was on channel CBS. Channel oh, two. okay. It oh, was Gone yeah. with the Wind. Oh, okay. It was Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Great research. No, I remember it. That's no research. <laughs> I remember the million. <laughs> my father loved John Wayne movies. And in fact, in 1969, when man landed on the moon, the only station in New York that didn't show it was Channel 9. They had a John Wayne movie on and My father was watching John Wayne and I'm watching Neil Armstrong uh, walk on the moon. <laughs> so anybody else? Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Great uh, show. Thank you. I, I hope it wasn't too long here uh, because I cut out about 45 minutes of it. Uh, and that's going to go into the Lucy thing or some, some other show. And so anyway, thank you. Thank you to the Reed Library. Evan, Evan, Evan yes. can you hear me? If, yes. you cut out, if you cut out 45 minutes, does that mean that you can come back and do part two for us? Because it was wonderful. Uh, yeah, well, the, uh, some of the 45 minutes includes uh, a whole one hour talk on Lucy. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, we could, we could do all that other stuff. Uh, I, I, actually, this has become plug and play for me. I'm doing this talk in Vermilion, South Dakota on um, Friday afternoon. And uh, they didn't have television in South Dakota until... Oh, 1955, 
And so a lot of this, uh, yeah. a lot of this, they never saw. And so I'm, I'm, I cut out the New York section and I put in, yeah. mm -hmm. I put in how television eventually got to South Dakota. And they had only one live show, and that was a kiddie show uh, called uh, 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 Captain Eleven. And uh, the guy who did Captain Eleven also was the weatherman, and he was on for like 40 years doing both the show and the weather in, uh, in South Dakota. And the Captain Eleven show was modeled after the Captain Eleven in <laughs> Minneapolis, which was hosted by yeah. Jim Lang, who hosted the uh, dating game. Mm -hmm. so, Interesting. Now, yeah. are we able to um, register for your Friday uh, lecture then? Um, you can, do you have a Do you have a website? I have a website, but it's the Vermilion V E R M I L L O N, the Vermilion Library. Uh, in uh, oh, actually, it's in Vermilion, South Dakota. Uh, it's I'll tell you what it is. It, it, the um, time of that thing is. Um, one o'clock Eastern time. Uh, I forgot the library's name, but it's the only library in, in Vermilion. It's where okay. the University of South Dakota is. Um, okay, and, and, and what is your website for future uh, uh, talks? Just, uh, for all my talks, it's just look up Evan Wiener speaker and you'll find it. Speaker, okay, yeah. great, oh, thanks again. Okay, very interesting. I hope you enjoyed it. Enjoyed it very much, Evan, thank you, good luck. And we'll see you soon. Take care, and I'm going to send it to uh, the library, and um, they will put it up uh, on their website. Okay. And thank you, Norma. Uh, Norma's gone, I think. <laughs> thank you, uh, Norma, for uh, for it, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a Sounds good one. Sounds good. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care.